Morning, everyone. If you could make your way to the, um, if everyone who's taking part today could make their way to the tables now, um, we're going to start in a minute. Okay, hello there. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Azure Craft. Uh, it's first one of these that I've stood up here and uh, spoken at, and actually uh, we've done three or four of these now, haven't we? Um, on various different topics. Uh, we've done some with uh, IoT, building uh, devices and connecting them to the cloud. We've done, uh, we've done them on various Azure topics, and this one is even more interesting, I think, today. We're building web games um, with JavaScript and HTML. Uh, Azure Craft is this mini-series of conferences that, that we've run now for a few years that are fundamentally around getting kids involved in the stuff that a lot of you guys that I know who come to our user groups in the evening do day in, day out. But it's quite hard to bridge that gap between what we do for a living and, uh, and what our kids are going through when they're learning. They're learning and they're growing up in such a different way to us and that all of these things that we take for granted, uh, and we've sort of grown up through, or were there when they were born, right? They didn't have to see them in events, and they weren't introduced to them as something new. These were just things that emerged. Like computer programming is something that was really in its infancy when I was growing up. Certainly the web is something which hasn't been around for more than 30 years. So um, we've, a lot of us here anyway, looking around for anyone under 30 in the adult category, there are not many of those. Um, and Actually, we all got introduced to that as we were growing up, and it certainly took off and was much more prevalent later than that. So to get kids involved um, and to help them with foundational skills that we all know and help transfer some of those is something that we believe quite strongly in in the Azure community in the UK. So a couple of quick thanks, and then I'll run through what we're doing today. Um, thanks to Microsoft for sponsoring the venue and help letting us do this here. Um, there are a couple of Microsofties around. Um, we like to call them our complaints department. So uh, if you do have any issues, there's mics over here. Um, and <laughs> but otherwise, also, it's, it's sponsored by Elasticlide, which is a company that I operate with Richard Conway here at the front. We have our kids here with us today as well. Um, so if you're going to complain to us, please be a little bit more polite. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it's, it's something that we have done for a few times. It's great to see a couple of faces come back before as well. The running order of the day is a couple of talks at the start, set the scene, give a little, back, a little bit of background, a little bit of light learning, and then we're going to carry on till about half past 12 when there'll be some lunch provided, and then we're going to carry on after lunch for a couple more hours, and then we're going to end up with a bit of a show and tell um, and a little bit of a um, ceremony around uh, how, what everyone's achieved. We're going to talk about what everyone's achieved in the day. Um, Dave's going to talk more, Dave Whitney in the back of it, there, star of the show, really, the author of uh, Get Coding 2 and 1, uh, but 2 is the one that we're drawing content from today, uh, and he's graciously sort of given us some content, given us uh, some starting material, worksheets, and, uh, and is here as well to help us with anything that we need to. And it's a, an entire book around how you write games in JavaScript, and that's the topic of the overall day. Rich, anything else you'd like to say about the introduction, or is that good enough? Um, just what, what we're going to be doing is uh, we really, really want to encourage all of you with uh, all of the great challenges that we're going to give you after building the first game in the book um, to 
Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as you go through the day, uh, we might not get everything concluded because these things are open-ended. When is software done? Probably never. You can always add a new feature, but uh, you can take it away. Hopefully, you'll learn a lot and you'll have a great start, and we can help you get that great start today. But then once you're happy with what you've produced, you put it on YouTube, you tell us about that, and then we will be issuing prizes and awards online afterwards. Okay, now I'm going to start with the brief ancient history of the internet and how games happened. All right, so one thing that we take for granted is the access to the internet that everyone has. Everyone can get online in so many different ways, from Kindles and phones and TVs to desktop PCs. But everyone sort of takes for granted how all of that works. And no one ever really seems to go through how it works. It's taken for granted. But actually, I thought, well, that's a great opportunity to bore some kids. And I like boring some kids. So what I'm going to do is teach you guys history. Everyone came here thinking, IT, computing, games, yes. And I'm going to start with history. Boo. But actually, hopefully, this will be very quick and a little bit fun. So uh, the guy there on the top is Tim Berners-Lee. And he's a British guy who is an academic and a scientist um, and is regarded as one of the fathers of the internet. He's one of the people who created the whole thing. Um, and really, the part of the internet that he created is called the World Wide Web. So WWW for short. The World Wide Web is 30 years old. Before that, it didn't exist. There was no common way of sharing information. <coughs> Websites didn't exist. And you couldn't necessarily just go and find whatever you wanted very easily. This has happened in the last 30 years. And given that we think about that, the ability to go and look on Wikipedia, the ability to go and search for things and be able to find any information as something we take for granted every single day of our lives, 30 years ago, none of that existed. 20 years ago, there was a huge amount less content. 10 years ago, there was a lot different type of content. All the videos and things like that have come much later. So it's a changing world, but it's actually a young world. So a lot of you guys here might think 30 years, that's quite old. But actually, it's very rapid innovation. And I'll take you through some of the steps that made it happen and some of the ways that it's changing. So in 1990, Tim Berners-Lee wrote three fundamental things, three papers or protocols. HTML, the hypertext markup language. URI, uniform resource locators. And HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol. Right? I'll go into what some of those mean in a little bit of detail. But what it means is these are the bits that work together on top of the internet protocol, which is a low-level network at how things can talk to each other, to actually do all the things that we can do on the internet. So when we talk about HTML, HTML is a file format. It's a way of describing content that can be displayed inside browsers, and you can usually spot it in a web browser. When you look at the bar and it's got .html at the end of a file name, it means a HTML file. Most of the web is HTML. And a URI is that whole thing there. Simple as that. That's a uniform resource locator. But without that, you can't do links. You can't link anything together. So it was a fundamental step in doing all this. There's a, there's a legendary photo of Tim Berners-Lee on the left and Vince uh, on the right. Um, Tim didn't invent the internet, and Vint didn't invent the web. So these are two things that people will confuse, but they're actually not the same. Right? So what Vin and his colleague Bob did was they invented something called TCP IP. It's how things actually talk to each other at a very low level. And what Tim developed is the World Wide Web, which is the things that sit on top of that that you actually use. <coughs> right? So you don't ever do TCP, but you do do HTTP, you do do HTML, and you do do URIs. Right? So what we're going to be doing today with games is an implementation on top of the World Wide Web. And if we put it on the World Wide Web, anyone can get access to it. But the technologies we're using are those called WWW. So let's go into those in some details. Um, a picture of a cat. Everyone likes cats. Actually, uh, one of the funniest things I ever heard Tim Berners-Lee say, and he says a lot, but uh, one of the funniest things I ever heard him say was when somebody asked him on the radio 
what surprises you most about how WWW has been used? And he said, I didn't expect there to be so many kittens on it. Um, and if you, if you look around anywhere, there's just a billion kittens on the internet. There's, just, there's more kittens on the internet than there actually are kittens alive today. It's absolutely crazy. But what is HTTP? It's a way for a client to talk to a server. Very exciting stuff. Um, but a client is anything which can talk to the internet, anything which can talk and download a website and show it on your mobile phone, on your laptop, on a tablet, on a fridge, on a telly, anywhere. These are all clients. Right? And it, it goes and requests data, and then it displays that data, and it might send information back and forth, like login information and stuff like that. On the other end of that is the server, and the server is the, the machine that's operated by the internet company. And that might be YouTube, and it, or it might be Microsoft, or it might be Amazon, it could be any of these big companies who operate these servers that your client connects to their server, and they send you responses which include that content. And they might ask you to log in. There might be back and forth to do that. What's my username? What's my password? Um, and it, but one of the core parts of the internet is the, the, cli the client asks for the content. And if your friend asks for the same content, asks to try to play the same video, there's usually only really one copy in its purest form. There's one copy of that held on the server. And lots of people come to it. And it sort of distributes it. But then it doesn't travel between those people it stays on that one server. So there's a concept of where that data actually resides. So your uniform resource indicators, very interesting things these are. They are how you address anything on the internet. Right? So a lot of people don't use them day to day, but the web itself does use them. So when I say a lot of people don't use them, it's because they type into that bar, or they type into that Google box, or that Bing box, and they say, I'm looking for Facebook, I'm looking for Hotmail, I'm looking for the, and they just type it in. But you could just type in facebook.com directly into that as a uniform resource indicator, and it will go straight there. So if you look at what makes up one of these URIs, you've got a scheme, something like HTTP or HTTPS. Then you've got a host, www.microsoft.com. And then you've got a path to an individual endpoint. These things all get added up, and it's like, how do I send this? Where do I send this? And what part of that resource do I want to get with this request? It describes how you pull all this content together and over what technology you're requesting it. And when you type it straight in, it doesn't go and do a search anywhere. Right? So I get incredibly frustrated when I see lots of people just type in some, a brand name rather than typing in the brand's location or, or uniform resource indicator. Because what that does is it goes through Google or something, and, and, and it, they do, I'm feeling lucky and it goes to the right location. But actually, you're sending all your information across to Google for nothing, which is actually not the point of the internet. The internet <laughs> is about having decentralized, no, nothing in the middle. Nothing can turn off. But if Google stopped working one day, most people wouldn't know actually how to use the internet. Well, how you use the internet is you use uniform resource indicators. I can see everyone is absolutely excited by this. But it is true. Um, how do you show that, right? So. The stuff that your phone shows or your tablet shows when you go and ask for something isn't what the machine shows itself. Inside your phone or on your computer, you've got a browser. And that browser is a technology that converts all those aspects of the WWW, of the World Wide Web, into a viewable visual artifact. So what does it look like? Let's have a quick go. Right, so I'm going to type in. I'm not going to type it there. Hang on. Look at this. Right. I'm going to do a really simple request. Right. My client is going to go and get data from HTTP website.org. And I get back an enormous amount of text. Right. So loads and loads of text. Now, all of that text isn't particularly usable to me. Right. But the browser is the thing that would normally have done that, rather than this black and white console application. Normally, the browser goes and requests that. The browser gets all these bits. And then the browser makes the website off the end of it. OK? So how does it do that? Well, first of all, the response is <coughs> most likely to be HTML. You saw HTML in there, right? I'll just go through what that is in a second. But there's also things like status codes and cookies and other bits of information around how things are working between you and that server. The status code might say something like, that was OK, everything worked well. 
It might say you went here, but actually it's not there anymore. Someone's moved it, so go over here instead. It might not be a good request. I might have typed something in wrong, and it would say it's a bad request. It might want me to give it a username and password to access that, so it might say unauthorized. And it might have gone wrong on the server side, and it might say internal server error. These are things that happen with the request at the HTTP level. So without HTTP, we don't necessarily know whether we can rely on what comes back on all these things. So it's built into this way of communicating. But let's think a little bit more about the HTML that does come down on a good request, because this is how we're going to write games. HTML is made up of a bunch of tags, and the tags are words or names inside angle brackets, less than and greater than, with a word inside it. And the document is actually just a simple text file. There's nothing complicated about it. If you just type it into any information, any web browser, any, sorry, any, any uh, text editor or word processor, and you will be able to write simple HTML. There's nothing complicated about it at all. That's one of the core beauties of its design. The tag name inside those brackets determines what the client browser should do. Should it show a table? Should it show a paragraph? Should it show a list? Should it show a hyperlink? These are just the names of those tags. You type them in, it creates the objects in the browser, and then you start implementing it over the top. It starts with HTML and it ends with HTML. They always have matching tags. Some tags have got attributes that help you sort of work out, help the browser work out how it should be displayed. So a P, which is a paragraph, might be told that it has to be in the middle of the screen, and you might have an alignment tag on there, align equals center. You might notice that this uh, is spelt wrong, center. It's all spelt American, even though some of the inventors were British. But most of the technology in the world is driven by the Americans. So we, we, we don't like to argue much as Brits, so uh, we just kind of go with it. Um, <laughs> but there are also people out there who, who will create workarounds. So rather than doing a line equal center, they'll do class equal center and spell it in English. But never mind, they're special. Um, the tags become the document object model, which is something that you can manipulate with JavaScript, and that's really important. So the browser gets the tags, gets the HTML, puts them on the screen, but keeps them as something which can be modified by other things. When you start off with HTML, it looks like that. So that's a HTML page rendered in Chrome on Windows without any style it's got a list in a nav bar, it's got a heading, it's got some links, okay? And it looks pretty awful because it doesn't have any information about style, so it uses the system default, which is black text, white background, Times New Roman font. So that looks, or effectively comes from simple code that looks like this, right? So what you used to do um, and how things have changed is you would write your document, and you have inline style. So version 5 of HTML is what we all use right now. And the previous four versions were fundamentally different because they would have styling information included with things like font tags inside the paragraphs. So you'd have a paragraph, and then you'd have something else, which wasn't a paragraph, which described a change to the paragraph. And eventually we realized that, that made very, very messy, very, very difficult to understand software. And what we want to do instead is make it more semantic. So that means what it says is what it means. So instead, we now have things like sections with headings and paragraphs in it. And we use a technology called cascading style sheets, CSS, to actually fix it up. And that's the same page with some CSS over top of it. You see it's got a nav bar, which has got colors. We've got some links over the top of it. That's CSS. We'll probably be doing some CSS today. OK. But the page is just the page. It's still pretty boring at this point. You can't do anything with it. How do you change it? How do you make it into a game that moves, that plays music, that, that, that does exciting things? We have to make it dynamic. In 1995, the first browser war was happening. And uh, effectively, there was a company called Netscape, and it had a product called Navigator. And it was being made obsolete by its competitor, Microsoft, with their Internet Explorer application. And what they wanted to do was do something very special and very new that would make Microsoft 
no longer the dominant uprising force and to win that browser war for the number of people using the technology. And what they did was they invented something called JavaScript. JavaScript is this way of modifying a HTML page once it's loaded in the browser to make it do special things. So you can add or remove extra elements. So you can make things appear. You can change things like styles or properties. You can make things animate, so change over time, have little frames and things move across the screen. And you can make it respond to user input, like when you put your mouse over something, something happens. And these are the fundamental technologies from HTML, which you download over HTTP with a URI link, you get your HTML on the page, a bit of CSS, and a bit of JavaScript. These are fundamental technologies that we use to write web games. We don't use hardly anything else. Most of these technologies are roughly the same as they were 30 years ago. And although we have moved into a much more nuanced and advanced way of doing them, and that's what you guys are going to be learning, the, the good way of doing them, they're technologies that have emerged over 30 years. Let's do some quick demos so I can show how brilliant I am at coding. I, or I'm saying that because my kids are here. Um, or you might argue absolutely terrible, but never mind. Um, let's see if I can't get a bit of code on. I'm going to do this super quick. So I've got two HTML pages on here. I have a HTML page which uh, has a set of buttons, and that's all it does. So this one's got six buttons, and I have another HTML page which has got four buttons. And what these do is using JavaScript in an on-click event handler on a link, do something. Okay? So we start off with an, with an image, which is defined as an image with an ID. And then we say, when we click these things, we want to change the style property, display to block or none. We're going to put a filter on it. We're going to put some blurs on it. Uh, and then in the other one, what we have is exactly the same, but with less text. So how did we do that? We did that by moving some of the code out into a JavaScript file in its own right off the side. So let's have a super quick look how it looks. It does pretty much the same thing. Opens on the wrong screen again. OK, here we go. Very simple page. We can click Hello, <coughs> and we bring in a picture of the front cover of uh, Dave's book. Great book. You should buy it. Available on Amazon. Also some here, but it's probably going to take them away. Um, goodbye. Goes away. Hello. Make it gray. Make it normal. Make it blurry. Make it normal. Make it gray. Go away. Exciting stuff, right? Just simple JavaScript on events. Click, 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 click. This is what you can do. Right, about us, OK? Let's show it again. This time, because I've used a function in a different file, I can do more complicated things. So I can make it go away, and I can make it appear, go gray, and grow blurry, go blurry, all in one <coughs> click, rather than two, three clicks. And this is where the power of the programming comes together. You put it into modules or functions. Those functions can do more than one thing, and then, you can do all kinds of exciting things in one, like send it away and bring it back normal but blurry. Okay, so kind of simple approaches to doing JavaScript, but all from those absolutely fundamental parts of the technology. Okay, they were quick demos, weren't they? So what else can you do? What, so if you want to learn more about the history before we get on to doing the, the cool stuff, right, you can go and look at the webfoundation.org, which is the organization funded and founded by uh, lots and lots of people, but um, Tim Berners-Lee is heavily involved at the top of that organization. Uh, he has a vision on there, really in detailed history of where it came from, uh, lots of information about what it tries to achieve, freedom, net neutrality, all this exciting, quite detailed stuff. And you can donate money to him if you want to. But it's a, it is a worthwhile cause. One of the other things you can do if you ever want to have fun is look at the uh, Internet Archive. So archive.org slash web, and that's the Wayback Machine. And you can look for pretty much any website that's been displayed on the web over time. So here is what Microsoft's homepage looked like in 1999. Um, and they were still doing exciting things like warning about the year 2000 bug. as a year, Microsoft year 2000 resource center. Wow. Well, the mums and dads in the room are thinking, well, I remember that. That was fun, wasn't it? 
Okay, so that's it for history. Shall we talk about doing cool stuff in the future? This is on. Hey, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, we're going to talk about video games. So I presume, have you guys played games, yeah? You play games? You play like Fortnite or Roblox or, and I don't know, not sure what's cool these days. Um, so so I, I work as a programmer by day, but what I really, really love is video games. Um, I remember being roughly your age in, in the 80s in, in Hong Kong. My mother used to hide my Game Boy. I don't know if you've got a Switch or a DS. She used to lock it in a cupboard so I didn't spend all the time playing it. And then I learned where she hid the key. And I went and used to get it out of the cupboard and play on it and then put it back before she could find out. Um, and really, uh, that's what got me here. So... I actually only had to write two books to get all of those books. There's a, there's a, 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 weird, a weird tip in life. Get a publisher and they do loads of strange things. Um, <laughs> but video games, oh God, to this day I still play so many video games as an irresponsible adult. And um, <clears throat> what, what really fascinates me though is how we actually got to where we got. So the video games you play today, uh, massively connected, online, multiplayer, 3D, everything. And what we're going to talk about is how those games work exactly the same way as the games in that book. Exactly the same way. Just with 50 years of software development effort put in to make them shiny and work and fast. Um, so computers are made up of hardware. Right? The hardware is the stuff you can touch and see. This is hardware. They're also made up of software. Software is all the stuff you can't touch. Everything that runs on the computer is software. And software... <coughs> is the collective noun, the word we use to describe programs. Programs are written in programming languages. And JavaScript in this book is a programming language, like Andy just mentioned. Um, so games are just special kind of programs that run on your computer that instead of letting you browse the internet and do homework, help you have fun. And everyone prefers fun to doing homework. Um, so if you have a computer, a phone, or a tablet at all, you are running software on a physical piece of hardware. So let's, let's talk about a very, very brief history of computer games. So those were computer games that used to come on tapes in, in, in the 80s. But actually, the first games, if we go back to the early 1950s, um, the computers in the 1950s didn't look like this. The hardware looked more like a big engine or a big machine. Imagine going into your... And into your kitchen looking at your washing machine. Your computer was more like a washing machine without a screen made up of nuts and bolts. Um, and they weren't very easy to program for because programming languages didn't exist. So the way people wrote software for these early machines is they used to physically... Imagine putting a load of pipes together. They used to do that with electricity to make those big machines do something. And that was hard and took a long time. But you know what? Even in the 50s, someone made a game. So the very first game that someone made, which was, I think, in 1951, was a copy of the game Noughts and Crosses called OXO. And they built it out of hardware. So then at the end of the 50s, the second computer game was made, which was called Tennis for Two. It was a very, very simple game, again, made out of hardware where two players had to hit a tennis ball, much like that ping pong table over there, over a line, a very, very small screen that was just green, and looked like a TV that your grandparents might have owned. No flat screens, this thing was massive. The interesting thing about these games, though, is they were made for two specific special computers. So nobody could get a copy of them. There was just one. There were two games, and that was it in the whole world. So in the early 1960s, programming languages were invented. And that completely changed how games worked. Because instead of having to have one of the two machines in the entire world that could run games, someone could send you a copy of the game and run it on your computer. 
1962, there was a game called Space War written, which if you've ever seen the game Space Invaders or any game where you shoot aliens, Space War was the very, very first one. And it was written for a computer called a PDP-1, which you'll have never heard of unless you're very, very old. Hey, very old people. Um, and it was written in, in Boston, in America, at a university called MIT. Um, it was the very first computer game, literally a piece of software that played games that could run on more than one computer. At the start of the 60s, computers now had a lot more general purpose programming languages. So there were lots of languages available, like three or four. Compared to the hundreds that are available today, there were three or four programming languages. But there was a programming language called BASIC. And um, because BASIC would run on lots of different computers, there was lots and lots of university students that started writing games. Again, on these very, very big computers that only existed in universities. But they used to, set, they used to trade them with each other. Um, so there was a little bit of an explosion in the games that could run on loads of computers. And this all, the, the ancient history of games ends in the 70s when there was a man called Nolan Bushnell. He was a serial entrepreneur. And what that means is he was a guy that thought he was really good at loads of things, so tried to set up lots of companies that all failed, um, including Atari. But he made this company called Atari. And they, they thought, hey, we've seen all these cool games at universities. So you know when you go to theme parks like Legoland and Alton Towers, and I don't know what the other ones are anymore, um, and you go into arcades, like there's the arcade cabinet over there. So he thought, hey, theme parks with all their roller coasters, why don't we put games like all these students in universities are playing in them? So we made a company called Atari. And the second game they made was a game called Pong, which then was copied onto just about every computer you have ever heard of in the entire world, has been programmed and reprogrammed by generations of people. You can run it on your Nintendo Switch or an old arcade cabinet from 1970. It was, it was that popular. So that was the 70s. That was the, the very beginning of, of things. <coughs> and then through the 80s, what people now call retro game consoles started to exist. So there was a boom in home computing. There was a computer called the Commodore 64 that was very, very popular. The IBM PC and the Macintosh existed. So if you've got a Mac, the Macintosh was the first thing in that family of computers. And the IBM PC is the direct ancestor it's the great, 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 great grandfather of all the computers you have on your tables here. So these were standard computers, which used standard programming languages. And all of a sudden, people could trade their games in their homes for the first time. So lots and lots of games started existing, from text adventures, where, the, where you're playing interactive storybooks, where you have to type what you have to do, and the game plays against the things you type in, to early games like Pac-Man, ended up moving from the arcades into the home. So the games were relatively primitive, but actually the way people made the games was the same as they were doing when they were at university. So then we get into the 1990s. So the late 80s and the early 90s saw the first Game Boy, the first portable games. They saw all of the characters you've heard of today, the first games with Mario in, the first games with Sonic in, all of these games came out of the 90s and the, the original 8 and 16-bit console revolution. So we're talking about consoles like the Sega Mega Drive, the Sega Master System, the original Nintendo. So if you have a Switch or a DS, Nintendo started releasing their first consoles then. So the first Mario game was actually Donkey Kong. And that came out in the arcades and then moved to the Nintendo Entertainment System in the late 80s. So you can see how there's this line through history from the early universities to the games you play today in your home. When we, when we get towards the, the end of the late 90s, like Andy's talk just, just went into, the internet now exists. <coughs> so in around 1995, there was a company called id Software, and they made the first shooting games. Doom, Quake, Wolfenstein. But the thing that they really did, they did two things that, that changed games. They invented online multiplayer games. So if you've ever played Minecraft or Roblox, the way that those games connect on the internet was invented by two men in Dallas, in Texas, in 1995. And that thing completely changed the way games were played because we now play them together. They also invented 3D graphics in games, more or less. Um, they invented fast 3D graphics. 
So the reason that games like Call of Duty exist now is directly because of the work of those same two people. And it's funny because you look at things like music and pop groups and actually you see that games programming follows the same trend. Lots of the big changes in the industry came from small groups of people doing little bits of research. So when we're learning about programming games, you've got to remember it could be you. It could be you and your friends that come up with the next interesting thing that changes the way games work. There's nothing to stop you and there's nothing to stop it scaling to the entire world and changing how people play. In the 2000s then, 3D games became the normal thing. So we're talking about your Halos, your Grand Theft Autos, your Metal Gear Solid, your Crash Bandicoots. All of these games was built on the work of the 90s. And in the late 2000s, our computers got smaller. So have you got an Android phone or an iPhone anywhere? If you do, that's just a computer. That's a very, very small computer in your pocket. But as computers got faster, these things that you could fit in your pocket could do exactly the same things as the washing machine-sized computers of the 50s and the games consoles of the 80s. So we saw a second wave of games for phones appear that were copies of earlier games and then did their own things on top of it. Because you write different kinds of games when you're writing games you can play all the time. So we're talking about games like Angry Birds, like Castle, Castle Crashers, like all the endless runners. So games are written in many different programming languages, but we're going to look at JavaScript. Right? So JavaScript is quite simple, and this is literally just a screenshot from the book. You define variables with the var keyword. You give variables a name, and you put things inside them. All a game is, is a program that takes some pieces of information and draws something on the screen because of it. That's all that happens. It takes a piece of information, it runs its game logic, and then draws something again and again and again and again. And by playing the game, all you're doing is changing which pieces of code the program runs. So how are games built at all? So games today tend to be built with what we call a game engine. So that's like the engine in a car, or the thing, or the, or the brain of the thing. And, and, and what a game engine is, is all of the hard stuff done for you. So it's all the, the code that draws things on the screen, or that processes button presses from controllers. What it isn't is the game itself. So people generally, if they're building big games for games consoles, will use a game engine someone else has built, and then they will write the rules of their game and put it on top of the game engine. So instead of them having to learn how to program for 100 different computers and 100 different graphics cards, the, they just have to write the rules of their game, and the game engine will do that bit for them. But what game engines do is actually quite <coughs> simple and quite predictable. So game engines understand drawing, understand reading user input, and understand loading files. But at the core of it, Writing a game using a game engine and the way games were written in the 50s and 60s are the same. They're all based around a game loop. And what a game loop is, is every second, or maybe sometimes 60 times a second, or 180 times a second, the game ticks. When the game ticks, it's like saying, step forward one moment in time. Then the game says, has the player pressed anything? Yes, have they given any input? Are they doing anything? Cool, what was it? Now, we, we have what the player has to do. We then look at our, the rules of our game, our game code, and, and decide what to do. So based on the thing that the user pressed, we run some code, some logic. So when we go into the snake game, the, the only things that the player can do is look left and right. They can move their snake left and right. So when the game loop ticks, it says, hey, did the player press left or right? If it does, the logic we run is turning our snake. And then we step the game forward so the snake will move. And then once we've changed our state, the things that are in our variables, we look at our variables and we draw something on the screen that represents our variables to the player. So if the snake was here and the game state says step forward one, we would draw on the screen the snake going from there to the snake going there. And the idea is, have you ever made a flip book in like art class or something where you draw pictures and you do little animations? 
Well, it's exactly the same thing. We just update our game state very, very quickly so it looks like things are moving and animating. All games, more or less, work the same way. Even the big online games, all that happens is the engine, the bit that works out what's going on in the game, is run on someone else's computer. And you connect to it, and your friend connects to it, and it tells your computer what to draw. So, let's talk about Snake. So, the game of Snake is a very, very simple example of a game loop. Snake is a common computer game concept. Uh, there's different versions available on literally anything, and the gameplay is very simple. The player controls a straight line, the snake, which they can move across the board using their keyboard. Pieces of fruit or bugs appear randomly in the world, and the snake tries to eat them. Every time the snake eats something, it gets longer. That's the whole game. And the game goes on, and the snake gets faster. And the objective of the game is to not crash. And the more fruit you eat, the longer your snake gets, the harder it becomes to avoid your tail. Very, very simple, but what we're doing here is exactly what I just described. We're looking for the input, we're stepping the snake forwards, we're drawing to the screen. We're looking for input, we're stepping the snake forwards, and we're drawing to the screen. That cycle is the same. This will go out in the email, it's fine. I'm not gonna read that out. Um, I'll give you some hints, though, as you're building your game of snakes. So there's, there's a few things. Right, so, so the book and the thing that will get sent around has a way of writing snake. So the great thing about computer programming, and I'm sure we've got some people who have some experience in the room, is there's a hundred different ways to solve every problem. Hundreds of ways to solve every problem. In your snake game, you'll have to think about some way to store a level to explain what the rules of the game are. You have to write some code to know if your snake is going to crash into a tail or a wall. And you'll have to write something that draws to the screen. So in the book, we use something called HTML5 Canvas, which is basically two functions that we can call that help you draw squares on the screen. Real, real simple. Canvas can also let you draw pictures on the screen. You might have to Google that, but you can do it. You can make your snake a graphical thing rather than just squares. Um, there are plenty of interesting JavaScript libraries, code that other people have written on the internet that will help you do flashier versions of the game or things that look nicer. So if you feel comfortable building Snake in the low, uh, in using this example, maybe think about using something that does a, a flashier, clever version of Snake. Um, and you'll need to write some code that keeps track of a score every time your snake touches a piece of fruit. So there's lots of little things you have to think about when you're building a game of Snake. <coughs> but please, 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 as you work through the exercise, you don't have to do it like I've done it. That's just one way. Plenty of ways to do this. Um, we're going to have a few, um, a few prizes as well. So best custom snake level layout. So when people build video games, there's something called game designers. And what game designers do is they try and work out how to make a game fun, how to make a game exciting. So the standard game of snake is just a big square. Could we do a more interesting level? There might be a cooler level or one that's more fun to play. Who can make the best graphics? So the snake in the book is just a green snake. Could we make it look like a scary snake? Um, and, and a prize for the most accurate gameplay. So make sure you've got no bugs. Make sure the, the game runs smoothly, isn't glitchy. So it's important to note, though, when you look at doing things like games and programming, Programming can be hard, there's many ways to do it, and you don't always finish. It's not about finishing. This experience isn't about being here and finishing a perfect game of Snake. It's about learning something, right? And you know what, if you learn one thing, that's the thing I'm excited to hear about. I'm excited to hear about what thing you learned today that you didn't know when you started as you worked through this. Um, so there is a starting point that will be on the worksheet that gets sent around. So what I've done is I've made a very, very simple piece of the game, which just takes <coughs> care of ticking the game loop for you. So if you don't know where to start, you can copy this example and start putting your code in there. It's more or less just a cut of the examples taken from the book. So if you don't know how to, to get anything going, please feel free. So 
when you're looking at this book, if you work through it in a straight line, you're not going to finish your game of Snake today because you will learn lots of little things on the way. Again, think about what you learn, not about the, the, the whole finished game. And by all means, when you leave here today, feel free to finish it at home, with your parents, with your friends, whatever it takes. Um, and yeah, feel free to buy my book. Perfect. Thank you, David. So, okay, so let's show one uh, screen, which, yep. Here, right, so if you, <coughs> typically that has gone directly on the line, so you can't see what that says. Um, one second, last minute editing. Just do the thing that you should never do, some spaces. Okay, um, so that link there, if you write that down or go to it in your browsers, it's bit.ly, and then it's some letters, whether it's an L or an I or a... Mm. Hang on. It's an I. Okay, good old Corey and you, that, that solved things. Um, so if you go to, yeah, bit.ly forward slash two capital I capital J lower Y zero Z Z lower lower. I can leave this up on the screen. Then you'll have some uh, artifacts on there that you can download and get going with. Let me know if you have any issues with getting that. I'll leave this on the screen so you don't have to rush. Leave it on for a few minutes. Um, and then what we're looking to do is the best custom level layout, the game designer piece, the best graphics, and the most accurate gameplay with the slides that have been sent. Rich? So, um, uh, so we'll, be, uh, we'll be around to help you today with anything. I think a great starting point is, the, um, uh, is Dave's uh, chapter on Snake. Um, we can begin there. And as we go through the code, maybe you can think about some of these, these things. Uh, and if any of you want to come back and present, something custom or special that you've done that isn't in the book, we would love to hear about it. So we're going to break for lunch at 12.30, so we'll, we'll go around, we'll try and help you out. Um, this, is, this is a team effort, so you know, anybody that's co any of the parents that are coded before can help out other, other parents as well. Um, you know, we all want to get to like a functioning game of Snake today if it's possible. Um, if it's not, we want you to take this home, as Andy and Dave said, and then come back to us and show us how you've done it. And that will mean um, making a short YouTube video, sending us a link to the YouTube video, and we can send it round to, to everybody. And Dave will be judging some of the, the best responses to this um, for these three things. Okay? So let's get coding, guys. Are we ready for this, everyone? Yeah? Excited? Let's do it. OK, so the first demos I think we have, I, I presume we're recording now. 
Cool, I'm good. Pretend we edited that bit out. Are we excited? Are we going to do it? <laughs> so somebody, somebody's going to have to stand here to show you this. Yes. The kids can stand in front of me and talk to me. So the camera's panning in front of the screen. Yeah, of course. Okay, so first up, Adam. Adam, who's Adam? Perfect. Well, look at you. You're up first. We could do this. Come on, everyone, round of applause for Adam. So, so how, about, how about Dad opens your sample and you tell us what you've done? So let's come over here in front of the TV so everyone can see you. Do you want the microphone? Do you want to tell us about your game of Snake? So, so you, you've obviously... You've... <laughs> So what's exciting, what's special about your game of snake? What did you add? I added a smiley face in the middle of the game. And what was the one thing you learnt today? that you didn't know when you came in? Mm. About the lists. Can everyone give Adam a big round of applause? That's amazing. And this is your game running? Mm. Yeah. Yeah? And um, tell me about your map. You made a big map here. Mm, I made it to be like a maze. Yeah? And did you do that by changing the, the lists? Mm, yeah. Well, I mean, it looks like a good working snake game there. You changed the colours as well, haven't you? Amazing. Yeah. Perfect. Well done. Well done. You did great. So next up... We have Chris and Louise. So who has the USB key at the moment? Let's make sure the USB key keeps on traveling around. Um, this is somewhat work in progress, um, and we're about to crash. Um, but no, we've both, both really learned a lot. Um, myself, again, coming from an infrastructure background, coding is not my thing. Um, so I was learning very much at the same, same rate as Louise. So, Louise, do you want to explain what, you, what you've done here with your, with your snake game? So, um, so it's like kind of like a squiggle, and you've got to kind of go around the squiggle. <laughs> so there's a video recorder pointed at this spot, so I'm moving everything here. There you go. Come on. Okay. Um, you so you got a squiggle? And, yeah. And how did you do that? What did you change in your game? We changed the hashes to go like, because it was like a box, so we changed the hashes to go like up and down. So here's your code. Mm hmm So this is, your, this is your squiggle maze, yeah? Yep. And what's the one thing you learned today that you didn't know when you started? How to code. All of it. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Can we give these guys a big round of applause? Perfect. Well done. Well done. It's great. Next up, Farid. <laughs> so go on the, the piece de resistance what, do you want to show us your game for it if you just hit enter on that keyboard it's, oh you got it <laughs> Look 
at this. And you died. Amazing. So tell us about your game. What did you do in your game? So, um, like, we made the game ball first, like, um, we made it first normal, and then we started making the board larger, and copied, um, and then made, like, four rooms for, for it to be harder. And then, and then you obviously, you, it looks like you added some sound effects, so how, how did you do that? So we went on like some websites and then we got the like MP3 onto the computer and then it started playing the sound effects. Amazing. Can we get a big round of applause? <laughs> well, I did the copyrighted uh, music out of YouTube. Next up, we have Matthew D. 21 versus Impossible Maze. I'm, I'm intrigued. Okay, Matthew, do you want to hit enter? Yep. <laughs> Insta-death. So t tell us about your maze. So it's really basic, but I tried to make it as hard as impossible as I could. Is it possible to actually complete this maze? I don't know. <laughs> play testing, play testing. Look at that, there we go. We've got our snake moving and we've got our random fruit. Uh, now I actually died. Incredible. So did you do the same thing in the pattern? So let's have a look at your code. Oh, wow. That is a, it's a thing of beauty. And what's the one thing you learned today that you didn't know when you came in? Really, how to code, because... Everything. Yeah, I've never known how to code, really. Amazing, amazing. Can we get a round of applause? <laughs> Perfect, thanks. Now we've got Rafe. <laughs> Here's a proud man. Okay, so go on, show us what you got. Oh, I got... A um, snake which changes colour every single time and um, and also the food changes colour and um, I did the background because I don't like white background and and mm, I don't like the colour green on the snake and the red apple. Amazing. So should we take a look at the code behind this? This is a this is incredible. This is very different. Let's take a look. Wow, this is all the CSS. So, tell us about it. So, when I went, went to the um, oh, the color snake place, um, I wanted to put every single level that you have each different color, and but instead, and when I done it, um, it it kept changing color. Uh, every time when I move it. Amazing. So you did some classic online research and, uh, and you did what I do in my day job every day and uh, you, you got loads and loads of cool looking stuff off the internet, yeah? Yeah. Amazing. I love it. I love it. Points for ingenuity. And now Simon Gallagher. Come on, you can do it. Come on. You don't have to say anything. I promise. So let's take a look, let's take a look at your snake. <laughs> do you have any thoughts on dad ruling? I, I'm not sure dad rules. <laughs> Is dad a bully? <laughs> Ours wasn't quite as advanced as some of the other ones. Hey, but you know what? You've got something drawing on the screen here. And, and one of the things I've, I've said to a couple of you walking around is that it's not about doing everything. It's just about getting something working that's half of the journey, right? Just getting something on the screen, getting that feedback cycle in, because this is the first step in a, in a full working thing, right? What's the one thing you've learned today that you didn't know coming in? 
How to Code. Have you enjoyed it? Yep. And there we go. Can we get a round of applause? <laughs> I'm now desperately hoping there's some more USB keys. Someone, someone got the... Perfect. Amazing. Cheers, man. Yes. Let's see who we got. We have... Uh, now this is going to confuse me. I didn't count on this. Right. The, the gap here. Aaron. We've got an Aaron. Whoop, whoop. With his snack. Okay, let's take a look. So feel free to play that. So here we've got quite a hard looking maze. <laughs> so tell us what you did. So um, in order to change the color of the snake, whenever I um, move um, north, east, south or west, whichever way the head is facing, um, we've set it to change that color um, just to any random color. And you can eat fruit and you get longer? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And what did you learn doing this that you didn't know at the start? Well, I mostly learned how to um, change the uh, speed of ticks and how fast I can change the game. Basically Amazing. Way. Should we take a quick look at the code and see what Aaron's done? It should be here. Bam. So I can see that you've got a, a very, very complicated maze as well. Yeah. Looks beautiful. We tried to um, change the uh, color of the fruit, but for some reason it just decided to stay gray. Sometimes fruit does that. <laughs> can we get a big round of applause for Aaron? <laughs> well done. I presume this is your snake. So tell us about the snake. It's a self-randomizing maze every time you reload the page. And I added a few messages after you die. <laughs> so if you oh, God. <laughs> My eyeline. So if you refresh the page, uh, it automatically changes the maze for you. So if you see the cubes go in different sections. Refresh the page. Okay. Look at that, that's cool. Should we take a look at the code and see how you did it? So let me... So maybe you can talk us through a little bit of this? Uh, yeah, so... Where did you This is where... So that's your extra game over message. And the random maze, where does that come from? Uh, so what it looks like we're doing here is we're picking a random number as we roll through our array and filling it with, with extra characters here. That's pretty cool. So you've got infinite levels. Yeah. Infinite levels. Amazing. Well done, guys. You've done really well. Let's get a round of applause. Okay, I think I'm, I know I've got some more demos up at the top here. Uh, Hassini. Let's open your game. Hey, yeah, how are you doing? So tell me about your game. Um, so 
I change the snake. Um, first, we did the canvas, and we did a separate code for the canvas, so we could discover how the canvas was made. And then we did the canvas again, and we made the... Made your map a, sh a funny shape, didn't you? Look at that, that's really cool. It works really well. And did you learn about Canvas by doing this? Yes. Amazing. And what, what else did you learn today that you didn't know before? HTML. HTML, look at that. Well, well done. It looks great. I love your map. Can we get a round of applause? So I'm looking for Snake. Where's Snake? Snake? No? No one called Snake in here? So whose file was called Snake? Okay, I'm going to open it, and we're going to see, see whose snake this is. <laughs> That's your snake. Okay, fine. Perfect. I think I'm out of demos here. Is anyone else not demoed who would like to demo something? Yeah? You got something? I could just see you nodding your head in the background. Has anyone else got a demo? Everyone keep their heads entirely still <laughs> unless they want to demo. No? We good? We got everything? So Amazing. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to, um, I want all of you guys, um, we've, got, we've got some prizes that we're going to give away, um, but we're not going to do it today. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to make a YouTube video and post it up and where you registered for this on the, um, on the user group website, if you put the link on the bulletin board, then Dave's going to be the judge, and we're going to give away three £20 Amazon gift tokens to the winners, and we'll announce you at our next community meeting. So if everybody could give it a go, because we've seen some absolutely incredible demos here today, so we want to tell the world about it, okay? So next step, YouTube video, okay? Who's, who's brave enough to do it? No, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah? Any closing words? Any closing words? Um, so you know what? I wasn't sure what to do with those piles of books. Uh, I don't want to take them back to my house. So I reckon if you're quick and there's still books on that table, I'm going to look in this direction. And, uh, and there we go. That was a really quick way to not have to carry books back home. <laughs> so Dave, what do, you, what do you think of the next generation of game programming? So, so you know what, what I'm really, really hoping is you guys are so good that when you will come for my job, you'll remember I was really nice and gave you some books. So that when I'm unemployed and I'm old uh, and grey, uh, someone will like help me out and maybe let me program for supper somewhere. No, you guys have done amazing. Thank you so much for coming. It's been really, really brilliant, honestly. Like, applause to you guys. Um, let's all give a hand to, uh, to Dave Whitney, who gave up his uh, Saturday <laughs> top five Amazon kids coding books and climbing as of today. Thanks, everyone.